All right. So let's talk about research and formulating the correct question. We need to, when we do research, we can't just say, so what's all that about hand washing? You need to have the correct question to really get valid information. And that's not necessarily intuitive. Okay, it's not user friendly. I'll be the first to admit it. But there is a correct way of doing it. And it's called formulating a PICO question, P-I-C-O. P is for the patient population. I is the intervention or interest. C is the comparison intervention or control group. And O is the outcome. Looking back at hand washing, we could say uh, patient population would be the surgical patient, the intervention or interest is correct hand washing. Comparison would be the, um, okay, now let's change it. I'm thinking this on the fly now. Patient population is the surgical patient. Intervention is the hand washing uh, dispenser inside the room. Conver comparison intervention would be hand washing outside the room. And the outcome would be the, the difference in uh, percentage of hand washers. Does that make sense? So you're looking, you're, you are, in your question you have your indicator, two different processes, and your outcome. Now there's level of evidence. When you, when you do this PICO question, you will get a, usually a large number of answers with many different levels of evidence. There are different um, quality of evidence. For example, if you have a research, a piece of research that did um, a non-random assignment and one that with a random assignment, the random assignment is going to be a better research base than the non-random. Because, for example, if I if I pick six students to do, run a test on. If I pick them, it's not random. But if six students get just picked out of the hat, it's a random assignment, it will give me more valid research. The best, of, the best research will be the meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. A meta-analysis takes a large number of studies, compresses them together, and then correlates all the information. So whereas I can do one study with, say, 100 people, if I do a meta-analysis of 100 hospitals, each doing 100 subjects, that's a study of 10,000 people. And that will give me the best information. Controlled studies are the next level down, with random being better than non-random. Observational studies are another level down, which is simply me looking and watching. And the lowest level of evidence is an expert opinion or a multiple case report. Now, sometimes a multiple case report is the best evidence you have. For example, if you are studying a, a disease process with a very small number of people, suppose you have a disease that only has five patients in the world. So you have a, you're, you're going to do your paper on that five, those five case studies. That's the best you have. So in that case, that would be your highest level of evidence. If you're doing something with um, scrubbing the hub for central line um, to prevent central line infections, you will, be able, you will have be able to look at a large number of, of uh, your large your your population will be very large. I'm having a hard time getting words out. I've been lecturing too long all at once. So does that make sense? Meta analysis will be the strongest. Expert opinion or case study will be your weakest. But sometimes the weakest is the best available. This kind of relates to your NCLEX questions in your in your NCLEX exam that it will ask you the best answer you'll have to pick the best answer of those available where and and the best possible answer might not be one of those available there are websites 
Um, guidelines.gov is an excellent source of research, as well as the AHRQ. CINAHL or OVID are very good library databases. And you can go to journals such as Nursing Research or Evidence-Based Nursing online. These are all quality sources of evidence-based research. Nursing 2014, um, AJN might be good, might not. Um, they may reference evidence, but they, they will not generally be primary sources of evidence. You can certainly look at Nursing 14 and from there get more information to move on, just like Wikipedia. Now, Wikipedia is not going to be your primary, primary source. In fact, if anybody uses Wikipedia as a reference in any papers you give to me, I will redline that as being an um, invalid source. But when I did my papers, I used Wikipedia frequently as my first step to, to, to get more information. So that's how you would use Nursing 14. Get some information, and from there, springboard into official scholarly research. Look at nursing research results and identify research versus a compilation of previous findings versus a nice review. I prefer primary research whenever possible. Primary research is research that was devoted to that one question rather than somebody going out and saying, look at this, look at that. But again, sometimes it's all you have. There's also nursing research versus non-nursing research. A nursing research will be published in a nursing journal. So um, critical, nurse, critical care nursing, CCRN, will, will have nursing research, mm -hmm. whereas um, New England Journal of Medicine will generally not have nursing research. It's going to have medical research. And medical research is not nursing research. In the paper you'll be doing for me, I require nursing articles from nursing sources. You can certainly use the New, Engl New England Journal of Medicine or the British Journal The Lancet. That's fine. But that does not satisfy my requirement of at least three nursing references. I want to see what nurses have to say about your information, not necessarily what everybody else does. I hope that makes sense. How well do you have to understand the nursing research articles? Well, you, you need to understand research articles, especially when new research is, is available and being published. And if there's no appropriate guideline for the question that you have, um, you know, if you have a question about hand washing, there's a lot of guidelines out there. But you may come up, come up with a question that really doesn't have a guideline available. So then you're going to have to do some research. Also, make sure that the, the, fi the, the findings are actually relevant to your practice. So when you look at a research study, look at the abstract first. Look at the abstract of your research and apply it to your PICO question and look at the summary of the results. Does it give you the answer that you're looking for? If it does, look at, the, look at a little bit more detailed. Does the outcome from existing study support the same conclusion or is it mixed? You know, that means you're going to have to look at multiple sources, multiple bits of research. And if you have mixed results, that's going to, give you a, a, that's going to throw your question into ambiguity. Look at the sample. Does it represent your, your population in terms of age, gender, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, medical diagnoses? Is the sample size reasonable? Bigger is generally better. Is there a comparison group? These are all questions that you have to look at to, to analyze, is this evidence valid? If you're looking at, at um, um, let's say you're looking at um, evidence for infection control in the, in the hemodialysis population, make sure that, that they're comparing proper samples. If, if you have only, um, your, if, your, if your sample population is only the geriatric population and excludes young people 
from this from the study and your client is say a teenager on dialysis you're not going to have necessarily um, immediately applicable information look at the setting was the study was the study done in the acute care setting or long-term care was it home care is this relevant to your question again if you're looking at dialysis it may be very relevant where the, where the setting was taking place. How was the study designed? Was it descriptive or experiential? A descriptive uh, research may give ideas on potential interventions. Look at risk factors involved. Does this con is this confirmed by experimental research? Look at the conclusions and limitations. If it says there were significant findings, that means the findings were probably not due to chance alone. And there's also inverse and positive correlation, correlations and relationships. If it's a positive correlation, that means if one, if one um, variable is increased, the result is increased. Inverse means if something is increased, the result is decreased. I know that may, may mean may be very common, but that's an important thing to understand: inverse and, po and inverse and positive relationships. Both of those will have a range from plus one to minus one. Zero means no relationship. So if there's a positive correlation of point one or plus one, that means as one variable rises, so does the other at an equal rate. Minus one means they decrease at an equal rate. Freezing, unfre unfreezing, changing, and freezing. We've talked about that briefly in the beginning of this lecture. This is the systems, the change theory. The first thing you have to do is unfreeze. You have to explain why you need to change. And the why is the most important thing to explain. Not what the outcome you're looking for, not how you're going to do it, not when, but why you need to explain why if you don't if you don't adequately adequately explain why you'll never get by in make sure you acknowledge the loss most changes will require some adaptation and people hate changing so make sure you acknowledge that this new new process this new reason may require a sacrifice or a change but they need to understand why then you make the change that's the mid-range process. Now, start with high task, high relationships, and then move to low task, high relationship. Modify the plan as needed. Look for mistakes and problems and incorporate those, those into the plan to deal with them. No plan is going to go smooth. There will be bumps. There will be, there will be challenges. Accept that as part of the process. Reinforce positive actions frequently and often. support challenges with new steps and new patterns. Major changes often produce high undirected energy, meaning there's going, going to be inconsistency, there's going to be stress and increased conflict. Expect that. It, it, tell them up front that you know that there will be stress and that you are there to support them during this process. When you start realizing successes, refreeze. Recognize, recognize the success. Move to low task, low relationship leadership. Step backwards. You don't need to be there as much anymore. Incorporate this change into the structure. Formalize it in the processes and policies. Make sure that it, it is just standard practice. And suddenly, this change will no longer be a change. It will just be life. Now, the errors happen. An error is a failure of planned action to be completed as intended or the use of the wrong plan to achieve an aim. That's the definition. In other words, something didn't happen right. Sometimes you got to say it basically, right? There are four types of errors, diagnostic, treatment, preventative, and other. That old classic other, the, the grab bag that, that nothing else fits in. There are the, the other types of errors are iatrogenic, errors of commission and omission, errors of planning, errors of execution, adverse or active errors. A latent error is an error that 
occurred but did not cause harm. A near miss is an error that almost occurred and then there's sentinel events. Let's talk about a couple of these in greater detail. Sentinel events are an error that, that involve death or loss of limb or function. These are huge. They signal that there's a warning that, that there needs to be immediate investigation and response at a systematic level. The top, top, th top three, top three sentinel events, wrong site surgery, 13% of the time, a suicide is 12%, and operative and post-operative complications, almost 12%, 11.9%. So the top three sentinel pre prevent events are about 37% of all errors. They require a root cause analysis. The root cause analysis looks at what is the underlying reason that this error happened. A lot of times it's lack of communication, improper planning, or acting out of habit without thinking. So you need to look at the processes design that were used. We have to look at all factors that led to the error. Um, was there, let's say, a surgical infection? You have to look at everything from pre-surgical prep to the surgery itself to post-surgical care. The agency's risk management department will get involved, as well as the quality improvement man department. The most common root causes, inadequate communication, inadequate assessment, and ina inadequate leadership orientation or training. We've all been there, we've all seen problems. They almost always boil down to those causes. Part of the root cause analysis, we're going to look at who discovered or reported it. Not the role, but the, not, not by the role, not the name. We're going to say that the, the PACU nurse saw it, not PACU nurse so-and-so. How is it discovered? What happened? What type of adverse effect event really occurred? Where in the care process was this discovered? When did the problem happen? Pre-surgical, pre post-surgical, intrasurgical? Who was involved? Again, functions, not names. We're going to identify advantages and disadvantages of mandatory reporting. Now, I think mandatory reporting is critical because it means you will get a lot more data. If you make it not mandatory, you're leaving it, uh, you're leaving it as a decision process of somebody who may not want it reported. We're going to have to ask, what was the severity of the event? Was the event preventable? Well, if a product was involved, what is the product information? Was it blood or device or drug? And then what was the patient information? We need age, gender, ethnicity, diagnosis, procedures, and comor comorbid conditions. All of those can cause different outcomes. We're going to look at near misses. These are misses that almost occurred. They could be an error of commission or omission that almost occurred. These are very important to report because they indicate not only that there's a willingness to accept the data, but also that, that you're comfortable in reporting it to instructors and staff. See, when, when students are willing to tell me about something that almost happened, that tells me that everybody is comfortable talking to me or talking to the staff. New misses are more common in healthcare organizations than, than it's recognized. And more than likely, they also are more common with students. It's likely that many students, student new misses go unreported. And therefore, we have a hard time helping students get better. If we don't know what almost happens, we can't make sure that it doesn't happen in the future. A lot of errors go undo undocumented because staff is afraid of being uh, reprimanded or there's a lack of an adequate system to report. Lack of computerized systems, if, they may, if, if the facility makes it difficult to report a lot of paperwork, chances are it won't be reported. And there's a culture of blame. Many people want to find someone else to blame. And that just does not help when solving a problem. And when, when reporting is not mandatory, the culture of blame 
will be used to not report. Some common care management problems that uh, will, will result in errors is failure to monitor observer act, uh, delay in diagnosing, incorrect assessment of risk, loss of information during transfer to other healthcare staff. That's why the SBAR communication is so critical. Failure to know faulty equipment or failure to carry out preoperative checks. Deviation from a agreed protocol. <clears throat> Let me see if I can say that better. Deviation from an agreed protocol. Failure to ask for help when needed. Using incorrect protocol, in other words, going back to well, this is the way we've always done it. Treatment given to the wrong body site is just totally inappropriate, and the wrong treatment plan is, is terrible. Med administration recommendation, there should always be a standard process for medication doses. So it's ideal if the pharmacy can, can avoid having to cut pills in half. Um, standardized prescription writing and rules. Limiting the, the different, limiting the different kinds of equipment. So in other words, um, one kind of IV pump, one kind of IV tubing. Physician order entry having physicians put in their own orders in the computer. At the facility, facility that I have clinical at, Holy Family, doctors input their own orders in the computer, which is really nice. It, it eliminates a lot of problems. Holy Family has a very concrete list of appropriate abbreviations, which eliminates a lot of question. Uh, another key structure measure is staffing issues. Uh, there was a big push on limiting hours to no more than 12 hours in any 24 and no more than 60 hours in a seven day period. That is stringent, but I think it's important. Staff that work more than 12 hours in a day experience a huge degradation of skills. And it's the equivalent of, of working um, under the influence of alcohol. 39% of all nursing shifts are over 12 and a half hours. And, are in, and those shifts are involved with a threefold increase in med errors. There's also a decrease of vigilance and suffering of potentially devastating occupational injury like needle sticks. So almost 40% of nurses work more hours than they should in one day and they make three times the errors than anybody else does. That's a problem. We're going to start talking about nursing informatics in the next section of this lecture. So come on back. I believe that it's going to be the last section. It's exciting. You're going to love it. I guarantee, no, I don't guarantee it. But you're going to come back anyway, and we'll be in for part D.